We're here to idea everyone, to fire up your curiosity and connect you with the people and ideas that shape our world. Watch, listen, understand, connect, create. Let's move the human story forward together. Welcome to Idea Me. I'm Neil Koenig. Hidden in the jungle near the city of Tulum in southern Mexico stands an extraordinary exhibition space known as Spheric. It's the antithesis of the familiar white cube art gallery being built from natural materials and designed with curves instead of straight lines. The museum's director, who has spent much of his career working on innovative projects, is Marcello Dantas. Marcello, um, thank you for joining us. Tell us a little bit about yourself mm -hmm. and how you um, became involved in the world of creativity. <laughs> um, well, the world of creativity has been around uh, ever since I was uh, a child. I've always been a very creative uh, kid in sort of inventing things and stuff. But I came into the curatorial world from a weird uh, site. I studied first diplomacy to be a diplomat. And at a certain point, I realized that I didn't want to work for governments. And I went to study art history in Italy, in Florence. And uh, then I realized that uh, the art history that I was interested in was not in Florence. Then I moved to New York. And that's where I graduated in film and television. And then at the time I studied also a special field that was uh, what, what's called new media, what was called new media then. Uh, and then, um, which was the connection between arts, technology, science, and many layers. And I began into the curatorial world by doing documentaries on artists. So I did, um, I started doing films about artists. I did films about Namjoon Pike, Bill Viola, Spigny Rybczynski, John Sanborn, uh, many, many different artists. And, um, and then this uh, led me almost naturally. I worked at the kitchen in New York in the beginning, uh, the cultural center that was created by uh, Woody and Stein of Azulka. And, um, and that was a good formation together with NYU and uh, all of that. And then I started doing um, curatorial work for exhibitions. Then I started developing concepts of exhibitions. This was a time in which the field that I was researching a lot, which was art, technology, and science together, how could these fields connect, um, was still in its, you know, very early moments. You know, people didn't do so much cross-disciplinary work then. I'm talking about uh, early 90s and um, very early 90s. And this led me to, to develop unique projects. Um, Naturally, this also developed into, developed into making a new grammar of exhibition style uh, that allowed me to develop museums, historical and scientific museums in Brazil, in Argentina, in China. And, um, and then later on, this developed to, develop, to making cultural centers and spaces and developing programming. So it's been, it's been 30 something years over 250 exhibitions, 15 museums in different countries. Um, and we're now preparing another three museums at this point. So there's many things on the pipeline. The pandemic really caused uh, a shake, I would say, especially on our ability to travel and our ability to connect into different territories. But my, my interest on in all this has always been into creating multidisciplinary experiences that people would uh, be able to learn, engage, and, and at the same time uh, appreciate other forms of arts that they, they wouldn't be exposed to otherwise. The fact that you've worked in um, a number of different fields, um, you know, mm -hmm. ranging from art to museums to, uh, to opera, I think, it is. does that imply that the the kind of particular, the specific message of the project or the work is more important than the form, that the particular form you're dealing with. Let's, let's put this into perspective. 
I am a storyteller. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a researcher. I'm a storyteller. I'm, I'm willing to make things happen to people. So I'm very comfortable in working with uh, historians and working with uh, scientists and working with artists into developing ways of telling, of making their message come across and making it happen. So I, I work in a very collaborative form with different talents. So I'm one of these, uh, you know, I understand curatorial work very differently than what most people understand curatorial work. I understand curatorial work as a way to foster the existence of something that doesn't exist, much more than selecting from the past. So I'm, I'm, I'm always looking ahead. I mean, is this idea of an artist or is this problem of a scientist or is this problem of nat natural world or is this friction that has not yet occurred, can, what can we do to make this happen? What can we creatively engage into developing this? And for this, I need to connect uh, talents. I need to connect people, engineers sometimes with historians, sometimes with artists, sometimes with uh, um, anthropologists, archaeologists. They all work together into trying to make this story make sense. And to, for you to make a story make sense, you need to create some sort of or create or research or find a ways to turn evidence into experience. So you have a document and then you have to transform the message of that document into a message that people will absorb. And this is a, prob a curatorial problem. How can so, we turn that into something that people will enjoy, appreciate and, uh, and be connected to? So does this mean that, um, you know, the, the view of the museum as an institution uh, is changing today it from how it was, say, 50, 100 years ago? It has, it's, it's been changing dramatically. Museums have, uh, museums were once very important and museums spent quite some time being left as just a storage space for old artifacts. And uh, in the past few decades, and through the works of many people that are rethinking the museum, the museum has gained another level of protagonism in the world. It's, uh, museums are places now where you discover new things, where, you, where possibilities can arise. So it's no longer a receptacle or a storage, but it's the initiator of, of grabbing new information, new knowledge, and putting it together and making it happen. Uh, so, and also for people, it is no longer just trying to understand the past. Sometimes the museum is the place for you to understand the present and the future. Uh, the museum is the place where in many uh, ways it is the moment in which we consolidate different fields into one place so that we can understand what's going on in several fields. So museums are no longer, uh, I don't think museums can any longer be seen as passive uh, receptacles of, of past evidences. I think museums are active engagers, initiators of new experiences and new knowledge. And uh, it has changed dramatically. And the role of the curator too, the curator comes from an idea of the conservator. You know, the person that conserves, that keeps that so that future generations will uh, learn. I understand that museums today have a completely different role. They are here to make sure that there will be a new generation. So when you're working with, I mean, you've worked with some um, very well-known artists, people like uh, Anish Kapoor, Ai yes. Weiwei. Um, what's it like working with people like that who may have a very strong vision about what they want to achieve. And yet you're talking about the fact that the, the, the spaces where their work is going to be shown are now uh, much more collaborative, in, inclusive settings than perhaps they were in the past. So, mm -hmm. so how do you sort of navigate uh, uh, that, uh, that challenge? I think, I think the beauty is that uh, artists and, and people like myself working with them love problems, you know, give them problems, give them uh, equations, give them something they don't know, and then they get excited again. 
you know. Uh, most artists I admire are really not interested in just presenting what they've done in the past again and again and again. You know, they don't, they, they just like, you know, they do something, they turn the page, let's see what we can do next. And I'm always interested in the same thing. I'm interested in this next, what doesn't exist. Most curators fear that because they come from institutional structures that are very rigid, hierarchical structures. So if you take risks as a curator in certain institutions, you're really risking your job. Well, I have always been very independent so that I could take risks. And I talk to artists on, a, on, on the same level saying, I mean, I'm excited about this possibility. Look at this context. Look at the problems we have here. Can we artistically create a new opportunity, a new way of doing things, a new artwork? And this is what really moves me. And I think moves them as well. That's why I've worked with so many high profile artists because people with, that are willing there, uh, you know, it's easier to find people that are willing to take risks in these higher positions, you know, uh, because they, they've, got, they've arrived there because they have taken many risks and they are uh, willing to find out what's, what are these possibilities. So working with Anthony Gormley, with Anish Kapoor, with um, Ai Weiwei, Rebecca Horn, Erving Worm, Laurie Anderson, Bill Viola, many, many, many different artists, uh, about 130 of them, and many uh, less known artists uh, from different countries in the world, from China, from Japan, you know, Makoto Azuma, uh, Zhang Huan, and, um, and, are, and then I present to them, okay, this is your new context. This is your completely different audience. This is the new site, the, your possibilities of articulating the site. We can engage into public art as well as we, we can engage into indoor art. We, can, we usually like to do both things. So we play in more, not only in the white cube kind of space, uh, museum and institutions, but also out in the streets. So I did, you know, projects with Robert Morris, Andy Goldsworthy, uh, Brian Eno, you know, all in places that they could never normally do. So it is usually the curatorial proposal to the artists that seduce them to engage into making these things. And that's, that's what I'm really specialist in, creating contexts. It sounds like a little bit from what you were saying that the push is coming from the more from the curatorial side than from the artist side, or, or do you meet in the middle somehow? I think this comes from both both directions. I think the appetite is in both sides. You know, uh, there's people in the world, and it's not only me. I recognize many uh, curator friends in the world that also are looking for these new kinds of problems, new challenges, and. Uh, the advantage that I have, having come from Brazil, is that Brazil is not a place with extremely rigid institutions. So the institutions are relatively young, and they are still building this, uh, this uh, system. So it allows for new ventures to, to fly in. Although we have huge audiences, we have record-breaking exhibitions. In the art newspaper, you will see or the past 10 years, exhibitions that I did were always in the, the top 10, sometimes in the first, and, uh, of, and because we have a large audience. I mean, we, have, we are a big country. But at the same time, we are a country that has the flexibility of uh, daring to build more audience, especially because it's a young country. So the level of tradition, the level of, of conservativeness is relatively smaller than the level of, 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 of daring people that are willing to do new things. This has changed somehow in the past few years because of politics, but still um, it allows us to do many things. But I did, I did it also in many other countries. I'm doing Mexico, I did in Argentina, Chile, Peru, China, Japan, Germany. If we look back at some of the things you've done over over your mm. course of your career, there's a great deal of activity and excitement in in South America. How much, how does that compare to other parts of the world? I would say it compares. You know, it's not more, and it's not definitely less. It's just it just compares because it has an energy. Uh, part of the energy is its um, its ability to be novel, to be new to offer something different. 
Um, but it does it does have an energy. I mean, uh, in in audience numbers, Brazil is up there. I mean, there is a, a lot of audience, even though you know uh, that that's something very important to compare. Now, when you take a place like France, France has fantastic museum audiences, and England as well, in New York, these are very important museum audiences. But when you take out the tourism component out of these cities, and you you could have tested it during COVID pandemic. You see that the numbers fall dramatically. The metropolitan, I think, fell by ninety percent. This and is the so Metropolitan you, yeah, Museum in New York. In New York, yes. So you would see that the, the num, you know, you would realize that the basic formation of this audience in these cities, you know, Tate Modern, of uh, Metropolitan, Noma, uh, Whitney, all these places are really formed by a, a chunk of tourism. What happens in Brazil is the other way around. We have relatively small, uh, low level of tourism. So what, what it means is that the audience that we built is local audience, not tourism audience, which has a completely different impact when you understand how you build a community around art. Right. You know, tourism is not necessarily a community around art, it's just casual crossing in that city. That person may take another 10 years to come back to, the, to your museum. Uh, which is not the, or it might just go there once, like what happens in the Louvre many times, you just go there once in your life. And um, in what we are saying here is that we're building the per same person is coming to the same museum two, three times a year. So you're really building a connection, a communication, you're building a culture of how these exhibitions are done. And you're doing it uh, through a language, through a locality. So those two elements, they articulate completely different when you try to understand the impact of the art world into society. You know, uh, the, if you close down the Louvre in Paris without tourism, the Parisians will not even notice. <laughs> it's true. So if, um, if you're building this kind of excitement in um, domestic audiences, in, mm -hmm. um, in Brazil and presumably in other places in uh, South America. Do you think, do you hope that that might feed through into more people engaged in producing art? I think so. I think there are more people engaged in producing art. I'm now the curator of the Mercosul Biennial, uh, which is the biennial that unites the countries of South America. And, uh, and I have been noticing a, a, a very strong change of uh, attitudes of artists towards the possibilities of what art can, can do. People are really, you know, when, when we measure the artists, you see that there is more and more people trying to uh, investigate uh, new frontiers and new possibilities of creating art into, and that goes beyond understanding, you know, the classic means of, you know, painting and sculpture and all, and it's, going into some other fields like social projects, uh, uh, collective engagements, social experiences, um, technology, science, biology, integration of biology and art. All these things are very fresh. I mean, they are energetic. I mean, you feel that there is um, uh, a true appetite, you know, into working with these new forms. And that's exactly what I saw at Spheric. I said, this is a problem I can't solve by just looking at it, I have to experience it. It's it's a weird model. I mean, it's a uh, when you go into the place and you realize that if you have a photographer with a bunch of photographs, there's nothing you can do with it in this space. The photographer has to rethink of photography, you know. And and then he, if you have a sculpture and you realize that there is not a single flat floor, so no sculpture will stand still and straight. Uh, and then what 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 does it allow you to do is to think maybe there is something that we must learn from our bodies because we can stand in curved floors why can't our sculptures do the same let's <laughs> talk about spheric um yes. spheric is this new project that's taking place in um, mexico mm -hmm. not far from uh, the city of tulum T yes. tell us about this um what is the project and how did you become involved during the pandemic, I basically one of the only countries that was open in the world was Mexico. So I decided to spend, you know, New Year's 
holidays in Mexico. And, uh, and I happened to have been, uh, and then I, while I was there, a friend of mine noticed that I was there, said, you have to come and visit this place. This is a unique place you would like to see. And I went there and I visited it and uh, I was completely struck by it because it's not a small place. It is a very, very substantial structure, but in the middle of the jungle, in a place with relatively low audience, it's a small town, Tulum and Umai, where actually this is very, very small town, but with a circulation of people from all over the world, because Tulum is a very strong hub of people. A lot of creative people, interesting people in the world go there for some reason, because it has its unique energy. And, and then when I realized the grammatic that the architecture was created, and then I, I said, okay, this is a problem that art doesn't have an answer. So, uh, and then I wrote, it, it was funny because it was my last day in Tulum before coming back. And I wrote an article about it for a, a magazine that I write regularly to about it. And I wrote it on the plane, you know, just the next day. And, and I sent it to Roth, the owner and the founder of uh, Spheric and Azulik and everything. And, uh, and then some uh, weeks after that, he called me and said, this is the best article somebody has ever written about this. And, and I said, thank you. Do you want to come and talk to me about it? And I said, sure. I mean, I can do it in April. And then I went there and then he invited me to, to direct the place. And I felt, I mean, whenever I, I am faced with a problem of a certain magnitude that I can solve, I, I feel that I have the duty to, to engage myself creatively into doing this. And I would love to you know, the art world is a very unsustainable place, if you put it in perspective. I mean, the model is based on collectors evaluate things and put a lot of money into it. And then the money is spent in a complete messy way. And then uh, every, every you, you cross the world to go from white cube to white cube to white cube, which is very ridiculous. And then you see the same painting hanging in a white wall in Hong Kong, and then the painting goes in, uh, in New York on a white wall, and we are just spending energy to repeat ourselves. I mean, can we propose to create experiences that are unique? You know, can we really engage into, yes, I'm going to cross the world to go to Tulum because I'm going to see something that I can only see there, and that will only take place there. Can we uh, challenge our system of doing things so that we engage community, so that we engage multiple practices? together in the project, not that the artist, you know, lonely studio time will, will define everything, but it's, it's the artist's interaction with society, with a community that will produce things. Can we uh, produce experiences that are unforgettable, that you will feel the heat, that you will feel the smell? And, and, and then I face, I put myself the biggest of all challenges when I face this, which can we produce art that is meaningful to other species. And I felt that if we can do that, we can do something really special. And, and I mean, and I really mean it. I mean, we really depend on these. Can we create architecture that will interact with the bees architecture? Can we create uh, a, an exhibition space in which birds can come in and can observe and change their relationship with the space because of the art that is in there. Uh, can we create art in which bats can come at night and look at things that we cannot see with our eyes? And we can create something that they will sense and they will respond to us in another sense. And, and this means other species and this, this means also people from all walks of the world, I mean, from all regions of the world. So, so I can I have to communicate without using language as a structure. I have to communicate using nature, uh, form, color, shapes, uh, everything that is uh, universal in that sense. And, and I find that challenge, you know, I, I just don't know anywhere else in the world where people are putting these questions on the table. If there is, I would love to meet because, um, that's what we are attempting. And, and the beauty of what Roth has built there is that he built the museum, but around the museum, 
he put in all these workshops. So you can make glass, you can make ceramics, you can make metal, we can make virtual reality, you can make augmented reality, you can make sounds, you can make uh, uh, textiles, fibers, all of this around. So artists can come in there and there's about a hundred artisans working there trying to develop things. So this becomes not only an exhibition space, but it becomes a creative space, which is a unique opportunity. And you're sitting on 6,000 years of the Mayan culture. Europe is a baby next to the Mayan culture. And, and we are sitting on ruins and we're sitting on language. We're sitting on so many things of what Mayans have to teach us. I mean, calendars, agriculture, uh, the use of water, uh, um, uh, spiritual relations, mushrooms. I mean, how much do these guys know that we have neglected for so long? So we can also offer that layer of anthropological uh, knowledge to artists. So if this, if this much that I have said to you doesn't excite an artist, uh, then maybe nothing will. <laughs> so the Spheric uh, Gallery is located in Southern Mexico and it's the kind of brainchild of um, this social entrepreneur and architect uh, called Roth. And it's on a large site, um, a, a part of a network really of uh, projects that Roth has started in that area, including a, a, a sort of a hotel resort. Um, yeah. And the gallery um, is rather an extraordinary building, isn't it? Can you describe it? It is a very organic form. So it's a building that it took me quite some time to understand the scope because it has many galleries. It has a big, big dome room with a ramp that goes around and then the nature grows inside of it. So there's trees. It has open pathways so that birds can fly through it. Um, it has, uh, we meet sometimes Scorpios and Iguanas uh, in the museum. It is made of basically tree materials. It's uh, uh, a vine called Behugo, which is a local vine, uh, concrete and fibers, many different from fiberglass to many different fibers that you weave through. So it's, it's a completely different kind of architecture. It doesn't have any flat floors. It doesn't have any straight walls. It doesn't have any uh, direct flat ceiling. Everything is completely curved. And in your, in your circulation is sometimes indoors, sometimes outdoors. Um, and you are surrounded by a pond of water and then you are surrounded by a jungle and you are really in the middle of a jungle. You are the minority. You are the smallest minority in that jungle. Humans are not a majority in that context. We are just a small group of people living in, in a wide area where there's a bunch of other creatures living. So this is the big challenge. It's not, it's not in the street where you walk by, you have to go to this place. You have to want to go there. You have a restaurant inside, very good restaurant. And then you have these workshops and everything surrounding it. So it's an experience. You go there, you more, you at least spend half a day, but you could possibly spend the whole day in the, in the museum, in the city of art, we call, in the complex. It's a catered experience. So, which, you know, you take off your shoes. It's usually, it's not so overcrowded. You walk in the museums with your shoes, without your shoes. There in the top is very hot and the bottom is very uh, cool, not cool, but uh, fresh. Um, you feel uh, the, the impact of the weather and the climate in the place, which is very important. So it's good for the plants that it has that heat and humidity. Other spaces are less. So it's not a place where you're gonna hang an oil painting or a photograph or a paperwork. Uh, it is also a place that artists have to really create a dialogue because Roth created an architecture, but he also allowed nature to build around it. So there's trees growing from inside the museum to the outside. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a unique place. Um, not only that, Tulum is a place that is a place for discovery. It's um, one of these sites in the world that you don't, it's not like, you know, if you go to Cancun, for instance, which is a strip of hotels in near the beach, you have the beach and then you have the lagoon and you have the hotels in the middle and restaurants and that's it. It's quite the opposite. It's totally hidden. All the gems of uh, Tulum are 
cenotes, which are hidden underwater rivers that connect uh, caves with fresh water from place to place, or beaches that are hardly to access, but when you, uh, or you go into a lagoon and you, and you swim in the lagoon with uh, stingrays and manta rays, or you go and swim with the turtles, you have to know where the turtles are and you give yourself. So it is, it is very seductive because it's all very exploratory. So it's, it's for people that have that in their attitude. So that, this I find very good. So it selects people from the people that uh, like tourism as, you know, I want to go to my Sheraton hotel and be on my air conditioning all the time. And then I want to have my food uh, predictable and I want to eat the stuff that I eat at home. It's completely different. You know, it's, it's a place, it's a challenging place for, for explorers, for people that are daring. And uh, I would love to communicate with these people more than any other people in the world. What kind of artists are going to be involved um, in the project uh, from now on? You're about to uh, relaunch it. Let me tell you the story of how this happens too. Uh, the place was built in, uh, between 2018, 2019, and it opened in 2019. And then the pandemic came right after. So it, it opened with one exhibition. And then it got closed for the whole year of 2020. So as, as the pandemic eased is is out and tourism restarted and the whole thing, so they started, okay, we have to rethink the museum project. And that's when I came in. So we're relaunching. The museum is open to the public now so people can visit the space. So because the space is ready and done. And uh, the first exhibition, I invited a fantastic artist called Hector Zamora. Hector Zamora just did a beautiful commission at the Metropolitan in New York. He did fantastic participations at the Venice Biennale. He did uh, wonderful pieces in Art Basel. And uh, he's from Mexico, although he lived in Portugal, he lived in Brazil, he lived in different places. And uh, he's just coming back to Mexico after uh, more than a decade outside of Mexico. So this will be his first exhibition in Mexico in a, in a long time. And uh, his exhibitions are usually creating situations. I did an exhibition previously with him, which was very nice. We did an orchestra of people moving and making things. And then you don't realize what are they doing? And they're all doing this together at the same time. It's like 48 members and there is a conductor and everything. All the sounds are Wow. And then you, in the end, they open up and what they were doing was ice cream. And he has that, that kind of ability, you know, uh, of, of twisting things around. And uh, he made in Art Basel these beautiful parachutes that flew over the space, you know, uh, army parachutes that were permanently flying over the space. Or in Venice Biennale, he got a Zeppelin struck between two buildings, between the Arsenale, and the Zeppelin was totally struck there. And the, the work was like, there was a Zeppelin that got struck into this. Or he did a whole performance which were uh, typewriters, people, you know, typewriters, the person, the typists, you know, typing at the same time in, in, in rhythm. So they would all uh, type in rhythm. What are we going to do there is we're developing this system to make this museum, to show the shapes and forms of the museum and making it alive through balls. So we're going to have 10,000 balls permanently turning the museum like a pinball machine. So the whole museum becomes, imagine you are inside of a pinball machine and the, and the pinballs are flying around you all around, but 10,000 of them. Uh, so that's the kind of work that, uh, we, you know, it's, it's just by telling you this little sentence, you know that you have not seen this art before. You know, you've never been inside of a pinball machine, which is a museum. I mean, think about what's the most prohibited thing in a museum, playing football. Right? I mean, that's probably beyond that is like putting the, the whole place on fire. And, uh, but uh, playing football is not an attitude you do in a museum. What if, what if the museum plays football with you? What if the work of art is the football or the balls or the little spheres? One very important ethical thing that I put up art is not a commodity. Capitalism turned art into being a commodity. 
art is a form of expression. So our art is a need of people. Art is not something that you have to make it in bronze or oil painting and let it last so that you hold value over. This is a complete misunderstanding of the whole idea of art. Art can be just something you draw on a beach and the waves come and clean it. Art should be generous. Art shouldn't be um, selfish into trying to hold itself. And the, the sadness of the art world is that most of the art produced in the world that becomes commodity ends up in storage for all its life without anyone seeing, without serving any purpose. So if we don't engage into making art an event, something that takes place, that connects people, we're really off of the mission. So Spheric is an example of a new kind of gallery where there's um, a, a much more intimate, intense relationship between uh, the project, what's on show, and the people visiting it. Is this um, a model that you know might end up changing or displacing the kind of white cube uh, model that we see out there? I don't see that it will displace, but I think we're going to expand. I think we're going to expand the interactions that art can, what, what art can do, or what art, art can be. You know, it's uh, going beyond the white cube, going beyond the urban scene and going into nature, going into ancestral connections, going into community engagement, going into other contexts and other cultures that can allow us to produce different uh, iterations. And, uh, and these uh, are opportunities that have arisen from the fact that we are no longer wanting to concentrate everything into some spots just for the convenience of uh, people's mobility into this. I mean, this is not a, an argument that is good enough. Art is not made to serve that. Art, sh art should be made to serve something much, 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 much greater. And I think artists with a mission will be truly engaged into experiencing other possibilities of what their creativity can be used and applied into, into these new contexts. And this is a movement that is going on not only in the art world, but in many worlds. I mean, people are realizing through remote work that can, they can have an office, you know, in the mountain, or they can be, you know, working in the beach. The world is, is waking up to the fact that most of the problems we have are related to concentration. And it can be concentration of wealth, concentration of knowledge. I have, you know, maybe another 20 or 30 years in life, I don't know. But I, I want to make something relevant with this. I want to engage into researching fields that my the, the people before me didn't dare to research because they were locked into a system that was created just to serve the capital, not serve the possibilities. And I think the capital will follow. This is the funny thing. I think also the capital is looking for these other opportunities. I'm not anti-capitalism in any other way. What I'm saying is that we shouldn't be stupid. You know, there's so many possibilities for even for capital to invest and research and create new possibilities. So you'd like to see art expanded beyond the art market, the auction houses? Yes. I would love to see art much, much further away than the auction houses. I don't see any reason why it has to be uh, translated into this. You know, storage houses, auction houses, and uh, short shows in white cube galleries. Uh, this, you know, it, it's a very narrow vision for something that can be as wide as making art for the bats and listening from the mushrooms and connecting with people from all different cultures through an experience and being able to uh, talk to nature and hear back from nature, uh, create architecture that doesn't exist also, there is, there is one message that I felt when I entered the spheric, which is a very simple message that anyone can understand. Your body is designed as one of the most fantastic balanced machines. We can walk with two legs. We don't need four. We can walk with two, which means we have a high center of gravity. So our body is able to adjust and adapt to different reliefs, just like what the earth is. But architecture 
for some very stupid means, decided that everything's gotta be flat. So what it's doing, it's impairing your body's ability to negotiate your, and this is the word, your sustainability, your ability to sustain yourself standing, your standing ability, uh, every movement. And this is a beautiful dance we have in our bodies. And the architecture of the art world is taking that from us. And, can, and this is very important to art because art is about changing angles of perception, seeing things slightly different, you know, showing things in a different way. Well, one of the things, one of the essential things about it is point of view. And point of view is like this. I mean, I could be having an interview with you like this. You know, my body can adjust. We don't have to be flat. We don't want to be flat in everything. We don't want to flatten out the whole experience. We want to allow the curve, which is probably where the beauty of art is, is in the curve. Many years ago, I spent a morning with the Austrian artist Hundert Wasser. Yes, Hundert his, Wasser uh, made floors like this. Yeah, it, with, yes. in his museum in, uh, yes. in, in, Vienna. in Vienna. And uh, there were trees growing up inside the building. Uh, when he came to meet us, he offered us a triangular shaped pieces of wood that we could put under our chairs so we wouldn't fall mm -hmm. over. On yeah. chairs. And, um, and Hundert Wasser was famous for hating the straight line. Yes, uh, he I, I love it was Hundert Wasser. Evil. I mean, is this ringing bells? Yes, absolutely. I think what we're doing in Spheric has, uh, uh, has a heritage to Hundertwasser, not aesthetically, but philosophically. It doesn't look exactly like Hundertwasser, which he plays in different ways with color and everything. And he has his own reasons, but I admire him a lot. But it has a lot of shared philosophy, you know? Uh, and I think this is, this is very nice. I mean, I think Hundertwasser is completely, a uh, complete genius that was not really understood to the level that it should. Uh, and basically because he addressed against the system. And, but the world changes, you know, from the time that Hunde Wasser was creating this, we've had so many things that happened that changed our point of view of things that Hunde Wasser maybe was so much ahead of his time. And maybe what we're doing now is much closer. I don't feel like we're now talking about the far future. I think the ethical, questions that are in the table for the project that we're doing are really much are in everybody's table. Everybody's rethinking their lives and rethinking their flat floors and their flat walls and their white cubes and their possibilities. I see, I just had a meeting with a gallery the other day and they said that we're closing all our white cube spaces and we're getting uh, fantastic houses by architects in faraway places to make our exhibitions in. So everybody's trying to think, I mean, the model is, is is it's not producing anything anymore. It's sterile. We want to go from sterile, sterility to fertility. And the way to do it is to change the context. And yes, Hundert Wasser is a fantastic uh, reference and influence um, philosophically for this project. Since we recorded the first part of this interview, the gallery's schedule has changed and the work by Hector Zamora mentioned earlier will now appear later. Before that, Sverik will feature an exhibit by Makoto Azuma. Marcello Dantas told me more. We have many shows in the works right now, but uh, we have a new one opening in March, which is, uh, in a way, it's very, it's very centered to our uh, research, which is, um, how can we create art that is relevant to other species? How can we create works that somehow uh, produce some level of symbiosis? So uh, we invited Japanese artist Makoto Azuma. Makoto Azuma is the man who has sent a bonsai and an ikebana into space, who has uh, planted trees in both poles. He has uh, put... Um, uh, botanical installations in the deepest points of the sea or in the deserts has created many sorts of 
completely radical interventions using uh, plants, flowers, and trees in order to produce uh, uh, a new perception of context. Uh, in this point, what, what, he, what the attempt is, is considering that spheric is an organic structure created in the middle of a jungle. So it's a man-made, artificial, but organically and impenetrable st structure that exists in the middle of a forest, of a, of a jungle. He said, okay, it's time for us to do the following. I would like to create a artificial tree made up of all the biodiversity that exists around that area of Mexico planted in this one tree. So there will be a tree that is not a tree, but it's made of trees, made of plants and man-made designed with, all, with, a, with a common body, with a common um, uh, nutrient body as well, that will feed this amazing biodiversity that will produce some sort of uh, symbiosis between the creatures and the plants and the that will exist inside the museum. So it is a, like a, a double conceptual thing. You have a jungle, in the jungle you put the museum, in the museum you put a tree, and in this tree you put the diversity that is outside to live together. Is this exhibit going to be alive then in some sense? Alive, completely alive. It changes over time. We have no uh, clear sense of how long and what will be the 100% the consequences of, uh, of what the initiative will produce, but something will be produced. And the audience, how will they experience it? Will they be able to sort of go inside it? They go, they, they can touch it, they can be around it. It's going to be an existing creature inside. Uh, they, because it's very high, it's 15 meters high, and it, it has the canopies going around. So you see it in several levels. So in some areas, it's going to be agave, other areas, it's flowers, other areas is uh, vines, other areas are just uh, branches, but they're all alive, coming from the same um, nutrients. Was this a kind of response by the artist to the setting? Yes, it is. It is a response of the artist to the setting. So can um, if we can create that, can, can we, in a way, provoke through nature to respond with its biodiversity to that context? Yes. It is an artist's response to the space. And um, is that how you see work at, at the gallery developing in the future? We are having several discussions with many artists and we are very much interested in how can we play between the context of the environment and the, and the diversity and the species around it in order to produce an experience that is unique. So. Yes, uh, I believe that he, the human, the natural, and the environmental um, surroundings will generally affect the contents of the exhibitions that are placed, that are developed there. And there are lessons perhaps for other people operating in the art world here? Well, there is the, the whole thing of, you know, can we go beyond the hygienic white cube? Can we go beyond... The, the neutrality of art into um, something that is completely uh, stable or not subject to, to context. I think this is wrong. I think, I think it's fascinating if we are open to understand decay, to understand, you know, I, there's, some, there's a, a phrase that I pointed out the other day, which is we don't want to make biodegradable arts we want to make bio, uh, bio agradable, which is uh, not degradable, but agreeable, bio, bio pleasant art, art that is capable of dealing with it. I mean, can we understand that things are not designed to last forever? That includes art. Life is not designed for eternity. So if we put that into the context that we can create things that will be transformative in its process, but also will tend to disappear 
uh, or be transformed into something else. Then we are taking out a lot of the commodity and, and uh, speculation aspects to art and leaving it to be more free, to really do what it can, other than just hold value. Marcello Dantas, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us for this episode of the Idea Me Show. Idea Me is a global platform. Our mission is to move the human story forward by sharing knowledge of the future. You can find us on all major audio networks at www.radioideame.com, on YouTube and Vimeo. Please subscribe.